I'm Phil, thank you. <laughs> it's really good to be here. Um, I, you know, I, I really, I had no idea what to talk about. And uh, I'm one of these people, I, I like podcasts. Um, and I was uh, listening to this podcast a little while ago. And in the podcast, there was a story of a little girl. She was four. She had never been on a plane before in her life. And for some reason, I don't know why, she was on a plane alone sitting next to an older woman. The plane takes off. And the kid says to the woman, when do we get smaller? <laughs> and I thought, that's so awesome. And it's cute. I mean, I mean four-year-old kids are cute. And, and the things kids say, the darndest things. But the reason why it's so cool is because it's so true. Like, the logic of that is perfect. Her perspective, as a four-year-old, is sitting on the ground watching a plane take off and it gets smaller. So if she's in the plane, of course she's going to get smaller. And so that podcast on This American Life, Ira Glass, um, I it really fundamentally changed how I think about what I'm doing and just focusing on this idea that it's really about perspective and, and one's own perspective. And in my line of work, whether I was at the government or now at TNC, people always want to know in conservation, what's success? So how do you know when you're done? And what I want to do today is kind of take this idea of success and conservation and say, well, it depends. It depends on your perspective. And perspectives vary a lot among different people. And so I want to walk through this logic a little bit through a series of examples, just highlighting where I think perspective comes into play and try to demonstrate to you that it really matters a lot. And this is not like we're four-year-old kids. Uh, it's more than that. It's we're scientists. I mean, some of you are L and some of you are O. I mean, I don't even know what I am. And we're different. We're in different cultures. We're raised um, in different environments. So culture, of course, we're embedded in the First Nations culture here, and it's an amazing culture, and I'll talk a little bit about it in a second. But L and O, ASLO, has its own culture, and it's different than different so scientific societies that I belong to, and we're raised in these cultures, and these cultures have norms of behavior. Some of these norms of behavior evolve over time and get codified in, in codes of conduct. This is how we, we behave, and, and how we behave is part of our culture, and we see the world through our culture. Um, and so let's sort of explore this a little bit with just a really simple example of, of why this matters, why our perspectives change, and, and why it matters to conservation. And I want to start with this just simple idea of what's a species. So we all know what a species is. A species is this, a species is that. It's somehow it's special. Um, we all, you know, have seen species. We name species. Um, what we did was to go out <clears throat> to some scientists. Uh, we, we went out and talked to some divers and some fishermen. And, and we basically said um, to identify some species. And so we, I mean, I ask you, are these different species? Prove it. They're really similar. Uh, what about these? Are they the same or different species? Or are these the same or different species? So there's a technique in anthropology called pile sorting, where essentially you give people pictures and you say, put them into piles. This took an hour um, to put them in piles of similar, that you would call the same thing, right? And so we did this for the Salish Sea area. Again, with scientists, trained scientists. Trained scientists and divers and fishermen could tell the difference between whales and jellyfish 100% of the time. Uh, they knew what a seal was. 
uh, they can tell the difference between a brown fish and a red fish. And they knew that some fish were different to each other. Um, and they made piles. And then they sorted those piles into things with similar names. And then from that, we can make a taxonomy, a folk taxonomy, if you will. And what I want to point out here, um, and I'm going to come back to this, is that in this folk taxonomy, they basically grouped rockfishes, sebastes, into two groups, the brown ones and the red ones. They were not distinguished. And if we look at this data in multivariate space, this is my favorite thing I'm going to say today, so pay attention. Um, remember, these were trained scientists and divers and fishermen. And so what we do is, is plot that cladogram in this, this multidimensional space. Uh, you see up there, I don't know, do I have a pointer thing? Oh, yeah. See? That's a scientific taxonomy. Uh, this is the commercial fishermen. So they all identified the species incorrectly, but very similar to each other. Uh, notice the scientists. <laughs> none of them got it right. Did I mention these were trained fisheries biologists? So none of them got it right completely, uh, and none of them agreed with each other either. Um, and so what is it? Who cares? Uh, I mean, it's kind of interesting, but it became interesting to me at NOAA when we were listing a couple of these species as endangered. And uh, we got a little pushback from the recreational fishing community especially when they said, you know, it seems to us that you're a moron. And the reason why is because when they look at the data, they don't see a decline. But what they were doing is actually meshing two species together. So they happen to be uh, this species here, which is called Boccaccio, which has declined dramatically. And the only reason we may or may not have listed that species, because we weren't sure if it was extinct. Turns out you're not allowed to list extinct species under ESA. Um, and there is something called the green stripe rockfish, which is increasing. So if you see these as the same species, if you experience them in, this, in the same species, and I list something, well, I, the agency lists something, the first thing you should say is, you're a moron, and they did. And it created this conflict, which wasn't necessarily based on belief. It was beliefs or values, right? We often think values govern our conflict and conservation. It was based on how we experience and perceive the world. So how we perceive the world matters. And I want to take this and extend this to this area here, to an archipelago called Haida Gwaii. So Haida Gwaii is a um, few hundred kilometers north and uh, west of here, about 100 kilometers off, off the coast of northern BC. It's amazing. If you've never been there, what are you waiting for? It's truly remarkable. And in that area, um, I work on Pacific herring. I work on them because they're amazing species. They're central in the food web, so they just fuel the whole food web. They support an amazing and important fishery all up and down the BC and Southeast Alaska coast. Um, and what's really amazing, and I think why I'm attracted to them, is they come to shore to spawn. So they come to shore in these massive um, aggregations. They lay their eggs on vegetation, kelp, seagrass, and the like. Um, when that rips off, that fuels a whole separate subsidy to the terrestrial food web, which is just amazing. Even wolves come and eat this stuff, which, I mean, come on, wolves. And my interest is really around um, how that herring row on kelp ends up as a really important, and probably second only to salmon, um, important cultural food item. And so it's sort of this crossover from commercial fishing, culture, and ecology that really attracts me to herring. Ooh, I don't know if this is going to work. There's a little movie here. OK, let's skip the little movie, because I don't know how to work it. Imagine a bunch of white dots going all over the place. Oh, look. <laughs> 
You don't have to imagine. It's true. They really did. So these white dots uh, represent a time series of herring spawning grounds in Haida Gwaii starting about 1945 and going, uh, 47, and going forward to almost the present. And what you see as it goes through is the herring uh, spawning grounds sort of blink on and off. But in, on average, there are some places that always get spawned. These areas that are, are highlighted here, sort of in the hotter colors, are places that always get spawned. Um, those are actually the places where there's historically been Haida villages. And if you lived in one of those villages and you were an elder, um, you would make an observation that wherever you looked, there was herring spawning. But that changed. Um, here's another time series. This is a time series of herring biomass with the uh, average in the dotted line, and what you can see is a couple um, clear collapses. Um, one in 67, that was a result of overfishing for a reduction fishery for fish meal. And then you can see it recovered pretty rapidly. There was another decline again in the early 90s and a slow, very slow recovery. If you look at the individual spawning sites within Haida Gwaii, you see what classically looks, oops, sorry, how do you go back? I'm, I'm really bad at this, I apologize. There. Um, you, uh, when you look across all sites, you see typical um, portfolio effect. So sites are out of phase with each other and smooths out the variance. So the total variance in the overall average um, is different than the, the overall um, variance at, at a single site. And in this case, um, the zero line here is, represents something around what we would consider um, the, the limit reference point for fisheries. So anything below that is overfished and above it is considered sustainable. And I want to um, zoom in on the end of this time series. So you see over um, the decades of recovery, finally it, it crossed that threshold to becoming sustainable. And so the government here in Canada decided, well, it's past this threshold, we should open it up. Um, not everybody agreed with that decision, um, to say the least. Um, there were lawsuits from First Nations, there were uh, protests, there was even this most extreme case in the central BC coast where um, First Nation members occupied DFO offices. So this was a big deal. Yet, according to the perspective of science, it was sustainable and recovered. So what's going on? Let's look more carefully at this time series. Now, instead of presenting um, what I just did, which was biomass, here let's look at the proportion of herring harvested. So in this case, about 25% would be considered sustainable. And if you look at this time series, you see most of the time they do okay. They're below, um, they're not overfishing. So a couple times they did, that led to some collapses, but mostly they're doing okay. But that's on average. Now, let's look at the places where the fish were actually fished. So where did the boats go, and how many fish did they take? So if we look only at sites that were fished, you can see those boats were taking between 50 and 75% of the fish, about, on average, from those sites. So what that means is, and what people observed, the elders observed, is that they just saw these boats coming in to their villages and taking all the fish and then moving on and going away. This makes sense if you're in a highly mobile commercial fishing vessel, right? It's efficient, that's what you do. You wanna catch your limit, so why would you take a little here, a little there? Go to one place, take as many as you can, move on. That's what we do. But this is what resulted in what people were experiencing, not what the fisheries biologist was experiencing. So what, if I was living in a village in Skidigat, I would see the typical noisy time series followed by a crash. And this is common across a number of sites that were fished, but not, not all sites experienced this. So there was fish out there, but at these village sites where people were living, they were crashed. And as a consequence of that, if we just look at the range of spatial variability, 
we see that spatial variability among sites just disappearing. In other words, we lost that portfolio effect. We lost the resilience. So what was going on? <clears throat> well, insight came from um, a Haida chief who said once herring lost their elders, so once the old fish were fished out, they lost their way to the spawning ground. So the young fish didn't know where to go because he hypothesized that basically they followed the older fish. Um, this observation that he made has been demonstrated for a number of different species. So we would call it learned migration. So cod do it, some grouper do it, Atlantic herring, it's been demonstrated in a number of species or at least hypothesized. So it's not that they're imprinting on a site, they're just following older fish. So that means when you fish out the older fish, the young fish don't know where to go, so a site would be lost. So we can model this if, if we're so inclined. Um, so this is an, a, just a straight up kind of a stock assessment model. Um, this is done by a bunch of colleagues and myself. And we see two alternatives here. In blue, sort of a status quo assumption about how fish move among sites. So it's just diffusion. Um, below, learned migration. So young fish follow old fish. And what I plotted here is just catch versus fishing mortality. The peak is just MSY, so that's maximum sustainable yield. You can see this is what we would assume MSY is, something just below about 0.2 in this example. So now let's look at what happens spatially. If we fish at what we think is MSY, you see here this rapid loss of sites. So it's not that we're losing the biomass, per se. We're losing sites. And in this case, it's the sites where, where the villages are set up, because the village historically was set up around places where herring spawned. And we can look at this in a different kind of modeling um, context. So this is work done by Dan uh, Okamoto as part of the Ocean Modeling Forum group that I'm happy to talk about another time. In this sense, what he did was say, okay, we're gonna have this metapopulation model and we're gonna impose different management strategies. And these are just two examples, one where we have no closures and one where we have essentially a closed fishing areas around village sites. And so what you see is not a whole lot of difference in yield or the, the amount of stock depletion, but there's a really strong trade-off between the risk of collapse at village sites. So if we close a village site to fishing, it doesn't collapse as much. Um, but that comes at, at a, some expense in terms of the risk of collapse at other sites. So there's just a trade-off about where fish collapse. Not really how much you can catch, because you're still fishing by the rules. And so what that means is just closing the village sites could, over the long run, make those sites more resilient and more culturally uh, uh, reliable. And that's important because to the high to people, hearing is everything. And let me give you an example from uh, a story um, told by Roberta Olson, who talked about when she was a kid growing up, um, and there's a lot of stories about when they were growing up and, and collecting the herring eggs on kelp. They used to go out. Um, they used to have a really good time collecting this. It was in the springtime, and they would go out as kids. They would dry it on the beaches and stuff like that. But it was something that was done by women, and especially grandmothers and grandkids. This was a way that culture was passed down from generation to generation. This was something that the women did. Men were out doing who knows what. Um, <laughs> but this was like a thing. Um, and it was really important and central to the culture. And when, um, when you lose the village sites, this couldn't be done anymore. So this thing that sort of brought the community together where knowledge was transferred, where songs were taught, it's gone. There's still herring eggs out there, but it's mostly now done in this community by men who are just kind of pairing it with another trip. And it's not done by just anybody walking down to the beach. You have to have a boat with an engine that can go four or five hours. So we completely change the social fabric just by not understanding essentially the metapopulation dynamics of that species and has consequences 
for the for that community and and moving forward. Um, and so, um, Ray Hill Warren has this paper, which which is a good paper, you know, not to say it's a bad paper, um, but uh, he has this thing. At the end of it, we're, it's kind of makes sense. So if a management system can provide food for this generation without reducing the ability of future generations to produce food, let's call this sustainable seafood. So my question to Ray has been, whose food? So it's, it comes down not to just how, much, how many fish are out there, it's who gets the fish. Indigenous people, that's my son with that salmon. My son deserves that, okay. Um, or, or seals. So who gets it? That's, and if we think about it through that lens, it helps us define what success is. Our perceptions will vary, and that's where the politics comes in. That's where we leave the realm of ecological science anyways. Let me switch quickly and tell you one more story about my house. That's my house, that's actually my house. So if you want to visit, it's not far from here, you take a boat, please stop by a beer. Um, and we did a very, the very same exercise there where we were concerned about, okay, what's your desired future? What do you, how do we define sex, sex? <laughs> how do we define success? in Puget Sound. <laughs> My mouth is dry, that's all that was. <laughs> so, um, one thing we probably agree on is that when we set targets, that's a societal choice, um, should be informed by science, and the question is how do we get science into setting those initial targets? And so what we did in Puget Sound is to say that management targets should account for ecological relationships and societal preferences. So those variability in perceptions about the way the world should be. Um, and so let me first talk about how we did this with ecological relationships. We focused on eelgrass because I like eelgrass. Um, we built a food web model, typical thing, blah, 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 you could read the paper. Um, what we found out is that um, if you do different scenarios, f let's say you increase eelgrass, that's the green line, fish that like eelgrass increased in our model. We're, we're, we're very good scientists. Um, there was also a bunch of indirect effects, and one of the most interesting one is this uh, trade-off between eagles and gulls. So with increased eelgrass, you get a lot more eagles. Um, if you decrease eelgrass, you tend to get into a more gull-dominated system. So there's, we can identify these ecological relationships. Um, so we did that, we have that in our pocket. Now we go out and we say you know, to people, random people, how much eelgrass would you like? Ten, you know, turns out nobody knows, they don't care. It's kind of a bummer. Um, so we took a different tact, which is, let's think about the system as a whole. Let's think about Puget Sound and the Salish Sea as, as a system where I might be interested in what's going on underwater, but people are more interested in shorelines, in, in urban development, how's there? transportation going and rural growth, housing prices. So when we talk about eelgrass, we're, we're talking about key species that deliver ecosystem services to people. We need to think about what are the threats to eelgrass. So in this case, it's armoring nutrients, sediment loading, and overwater structures that shade the eelgrass. And of course, fixing all this stuff costs money. And so we can just say, what's the effect of human activities on eelgrass? What's the change of eelgrass on the Puget Sound food web? The iconic species especially that people are reacting to. And then how does it all cost? And then what we did was take all that information and put it into a whole series of scenarios. These are four, we did about 10, ranging from, um, we, we took all the people out 
of Seattle and the entire Salish Sea um, to massive uncontrolled overgrowth. And these were based on growth scenarios that were done by the county and others in this region. And so you can see what's happening on water and then un underwater. And these images were done in um, collaboration with some landscape architects who do all this kind of computer visualization. And so this is actually supposed to be quantitatively correct, except for the seals look like manatees. But I hope you don't notice. Um, we presented the information to people in lots of different ways. So we had those visuals, we have these kind of pedal plots, we had narratives, we had different ways, and we had workshops with about uh, 400 people total. And we we're basically asking them about their, what do they, what do they like? like how, so they see all these images, how would they rank them? Zero being just fine, minus two, I hate it, plus two, great. Um, and so you see um, maybe what you would expect. Um, most people supported, oh, here it is. Uh, most people supported uh, a pretty moderate increase in seagrass, and that gave more salmon, herring, orcas, crabs, and stuff like that, eagles. Um, they, they were very upset if I took people away. I often got the question, well, if there's no people, would I still be there? Um, another interesting result is, of course, we asked about politics, because, uh, you know, we could. Uh, it turns out restoration is a bipartisan issue. Um, if you look at this, it's, it's actually quite amazing that um, Democrats and Republicans, the peak of that curve is about the same. So the most desirable point is, is close to the same. Um, the difference is that Republicans stop wanting to pay for stuff afterwards, so the cost gets too high, and so, so it goes down a little earlier than the Democrats. But I, actually, for me, this was um, hopeful to see these results. And so what we've concluded from this is that, you know, depending on what you're willing to pay, most people in Puget Sound are willing to, to support financially and otherwise an increase in 10 to 20 percent more eelgrass, which is a lot more eelgrass. Um, how people, uh, and we have a lot of data on people's normative orientation, had a big impact. Um, and, and the thing for me as I kind of went through this exercise is, you know, I'm sort of democratizing uh, management targets, basically. I'm saying, what do you think it should be? Um, I'm not asking scientists, I'm asking basically people on the street. Um, and so does this reduce the influence of science? Is it, you know, just surrendering our scientific sort of role? Or is this the way we have to do restoration in a democracy where people's votes ultimately determine what happens. I don't know. Happy to talk over beer about it. But, oops. In the end, um, I lost two circles. It's very sad. <laughs> Imagine two more circles. Um, so in the end, when we think about sustainability, it's really this balance between people, planet, and profit. And sustainability is somehow integrating those three things. But how we do that varies depending on our perceptions of the world and what we value, and also just what we, you know, where we're at, how we're raised. Um, so how we view the world isn't affected by our language, our norms, where we grew up and all that. Um, and that leads me back to the little girl. And I just wonder, you know, to what extent are we thinking in science that, you know, we're gonna, we should get smaller? I mean, metaphorically, that that our perception of the world is, is accurate and, and the only one. And, and by that, I don't mean scientists, I mean you in ASLO versus you in the Society for Conservation.
versus somebody over here in fisheries. We all have these different cultures and mindsets, you know, let alone people who aren't scientists. And we're siloed. And when I think about silos, I think about Sony Walkmans, as I'm sure you do. <laughs> um, you, may, you may know this story. Um, you don't see a lot of Walkmans these days. Uh, and do you, you also don't see a lot of like Sony anything. Uh, and you know what happened? It's kind of interesting. Um, so Sony had their hardware, their software, and music divisions in three separate silos. And the company was set up so they competed it against each other and they cannibalized each other even for people. And it, they didn't communicate. And so what that led is to their demise. So Apple rose up with a different business model where there was less siloing, and they won, essentially, and the Walkman disappeared. So when we think about the ocean, we have different perspectives, it's true, in our different disciplines. Um, we're siloed, we really are. You know, you have to go to university to see those silos. But I don't want the ocean to go the way of the Walkman. Or, because for, for you L people, lakes and streams too, even rivers. Um, I mean, for me, it's too important. And so, I'm, I guess I'm here, and I guess I do my job with the goal of breaking down silos. Because I think we have to break down silos and improve interdisciplinary science if we're going to have any hope of saving our natural world. To me, it's just too important not to, and I hope you will join me along the way. Thanks.